so, how long ago did I lose faith in the New Testament? My faith in the New Testament began to crumble in April of 2015 when I was on holiday in California. My good friend Brian had messaged me the previous evening, which was Erev Shabbat, to say that he and his wife were having serious problems. Problems with something that they'd been studying that very afternoon. The problems that they could say nothing about over the phone, not even text. But they would wait until Shabbat when they would come across and see us. They normally never ever travel on the Sabbath, so I knew this was going to be something really big and something really important. And I prayed that night that my heart would be prepared for the news they would be sharing. So Sabbath came and we met as usual for our video meeting where we read Torah and we pray and study together. Within an hour of the meeting, ending my friends were with me. Brian gave me a book to read and I can't even recall what the book was called and I certainly don't recall the text that I read in that book but this I do know that what I read made me ask the question that I never ever thought I would have to ask myself and that question was had the Messiah come? Even asking the question brought such a shake into my physical body that I was quivering inside. My hands were freezing cold, I couldn't think straight, but I had no answers. I just knew that I was a mess and didn't know what to do. So I was in such a state that Brian and his wife took me back to their home and we spent the next couple of days together. On the Sabbath afternoon I was talking with my friend Brian and I said, what do we do, who do we turn to? So Brian mentioned this good friend of ours named Clayton. The Clayton, I'll speak a bit more about Clayton later, but he was somebody that I completely trashed last year when, when he came this way and I labelled him a heretic. And yet before I flew out to California in, in April of this year, just about a week before I'd been led to put it right with Clayton, and I'm just so, so glad that I did. And he was far more gracious to me than I was to him last year. So Baruch Hashem for breaches that get repaired. And so I messaged Clayton there and then on the Sabbath afternoon, something I normally never do, never normally, never normally go on Facebook on the Sabbath, but it was just so desperate. And Clayton answered within, within minutes, and he put us in touch with um, a rabbi, Michael Skoback, I'd never even heard of Rabbi Michael Skoback. So after the Sabbath was finished, um, I sent a, a message to, to Rabbi Skoback saying that we needed to talk because of what had happened to myself and to Brian and to his wife. And on the Shabbat, we arranged a time for us to speak on the Monday. So all day Sunday, we just watched Rabbi Michael Skoback's YouTube videos back to back and as we watched, the more we watched, the more the pillars of long-held beliefs began to crumble. We watched videos on scripture twisting and Isaiah 53 and many many more videos that I can't even recall now. And so we did speak to Rabbi Michael the following day and that was for about an hour and a half and we were given some really solid information. When you began your journey, what was your faith? Did you lose faith in Jesus at the same time? My faith was Messianic. Having believed that way for nearly a year, having come to Messianics in May of 2014, after 30 years in the Christian Church, I'd been raised in the Pentecostal Church from a, from a child and thought that any other way was, was totally wrong. My faith in Jesus didn't begin to disappear, at least not overnight, because I'd come to the belief through study that Jesus was not the Messiah, but I just thought it was Yeshua, just using his Hebrew name, but I was later to, to discover that even that wasn't right. Little realising that it's a name for the sovereign act of Hashem 
when he brings a physical and not a soulish deliverance to, to an individual or to a nation. After all, 30 years of believing one way does not change overnight. And there was no Torah to knock download as every point had to be worked through. I do remember that Isaiah 53 was a big one. It took nearly a week to work through that one. Other supposed messianic scriptures such as Zechariah 13, 6. These are the wounds that I received in the house of my friends and others were swiftly dealt with because by now I purchased Rabbi Toby Asinga's excellent books. Let's get biblical. I was supposed to be on holiday but I would spend hours immersed in these books with the Tanakh open at my side and as I began to read these scriptures in context I began to see that indeed our fathers have inherited lies as Jeremiah records in chapter 16 of his book. I did end up renouncing the Messianic movements in May of this year 2015 in much the same way as I'd renounced my involvement with Christianity in, in October of 2014. What events led me to question the New Testament? When I began to read Rabbi Singer's Let's Get Biblical and watch the scripture twisting video again and again by Rabbi Michael Skoback with the twisted scriptures in plain sight on the screen for all to see I began to have the idea that I should do my own research and so I began a journey through the Gospel of Matthew I'd already seen the teaching that the genealogy of Jesus Christ was was a big fail and in fact I began to compile an ad hoc list going all over the scriptures to compile this list of fails but I knew that I should start in an orderly fashion so I started in with, with Matthew 2 and the first one I came across was Matthew 2.15 where Matthew quotes the prophet Hosea out of Egypt have I called my son so I checked out Hosea 11.1 1, and it doesn't say that at all what Hosea 11.1 1 says is when Israel was a child I loved him and out of Egypt have I called my son and I was quite I was quite chuffed I was quite glad that I've actually found my first fail on my own but I don't doubt that many thousands of people have been there before and, and found the fail that that one is then I checked out Matthew 2 18 when it says that it might be fulfilled that which was written by the prophet Jeremiah Behold, there was a voice heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, for they were no more. A quotation from Jeremiah 31.15. If we read the following verse, verse 16, we read that Hashem promises that they will return, because those two verses are speaking about the mourning for those in captivity, and how they will return from the land of the enemy according to the promise of Hashem. So we can see from this that Matthew is already being very selective in his use of the quotations from the Tanakh. I also discovered on this theme that from one teaching that Josephus, who devoted so much of his famous work to Herod, nearly 40 chapters in fact, never ever mentioned the supposed slaughter of the infants. You would think that if such a large slaughter had taken place then it would be recorded in history somewhere, but it wasn't. And so one knew that, knew that it had been used in conjunction with Jeremiah 31 to make the Christian Messianic Messiah fit the text. But it doesn't at all. It's a complete abuse of the Tanakh. The last one I would quote, because I could go on and on, but then that would be pointless because there's so much evidence out there already. But the last one I'll quote is Matthew 2.23. He shall be called a Nazarene. You will search as I searched in vain to find that scripture it does not exist. How did it make you feel when you were questioning the validity of the New Testament? My questioning of the New Testament did not actually begin until I had this faith crisis about the Messiah in April this year 2015. As a messianic believer I still fervently trusted and relied upon it it felt strange, but it also felt so very right. 
because by now I knew that if just one scripture didn't line up with the Tanakh, then the whole volume had to be questioned. I felt I was on a personal crusade to disprove the New Testament, although many, many more had been there before me. The reason it felt strange is because this was the volume that I'd been brought up on. I'd quoted it when witnessing to friends and to anyone who would listen. I used to quote it in prayer, saying such things as, it is written, only now to discover that, well, it wasn't. Only a few days into my search of the New Testament, I felt like Sherlock Holmes. I was, I was ravenous for more evidence. This process was not always accompanied with such feelings, because the old ways seem to come back and bite you, but they do go away. Thoughts like, well, this is speaking of a scripture in the Tanakh. I need to go there, read it in context, and then find it to be another failure of the Christian messianic mindset and the scriptures that they use. The mindset tells us that we can see Jesus Yeshua all over the Tanakh, when in fact he's not there at all. It was a roller coaster ride, I don't mind telling you, but there were more highs than lows. I now know that the New Testament is completely unreliable. It's a completely unreliable document, and I hardly ever read it now except when I have the time to continue my list of fails, but my list of things to study now takes precedence. What effect did your leaving Jesus have on your personal relationship with family and friends? Well, as I have no blood family living, but have many friends, it wasn't as big a deal as I imagined it to be. By now I was so used to people blocking me on Facebook when I moved belief from Jesus to Yeshua that it didn't... I was disappointed with some because I thought I thought better of them. So when I actually came out and declared that I was pursuing Judaism, there was not as much flack as I thought I would have. I've been leading up to this on Facebook by posting things that were a little more overtly Jewish than Messianic. Some comments were made on my page like, Are you turning Jewish? I didn't answer them. I was able to resist the temptation to see who were still my friends because I was not going to measure the rightness of what I'd done or the number of friends that I still had. I would have been content with none because I was so convinced and still am so convinced of the rightness of leaving Jesus and the Christian Church and leaving the Messianic movement and Yeshua. Some friends have blocked me and some still send me hateful email. I will occasionally respond but not on a regular basis. Is your understanding of a relationship with God different now than before? It's very different now. I had imagined him to be this angry God waiting to get me. If I even but flinched the wrong way or looked the wrong way, I would be distraught until I had prayed and confessed my sins. Sometimes spending long hours trying to find peace and solace for my soul only to find myself doing the same thing again and again. Hours later, the clouds of guilt and shame and fear would hang around for hours and hours and I remember even now how desperate they, those times were as I waited to feel right with God again. However, I would never give up. In fact, I never did give up on the belief that God loved me. For 30 years I've been praying, but maybe not hard enough, but praying nonetheless that I might know God as Father. As my earthly father died when I was seven, it was even more important for me to know God as Father. When I renounced Christianity back in October 2014, I began to pray that I would be purged of Christianity. But I'd forgotten a prayer that I'd prayed months prior to that, and that was that he would remove the veil and bring me into a deeper relationship with himself. And in one hit, in April of 2015, he shook the very foundations of my belief system. Now my relationship with him is far healthier. I no longer live with the fear of doing wrong. 
but know that I can get on with my life knowing that when I do sin, I have to stop and ask for forgiveness. I repent, I do teshuva, I turn around and I know that I receive forgiveness. There's no fearful waiting for the right feeling to confirm that he's heard my prayer. It's just something that I know in my heart my prayer has been answered. It's also wonderful, it's a wonderful relief to know that the way to him is a direct one now, there is no one to go through to get to him. How can one have a relationship with anyone if they have to go through someone else to have that relationship? You can't, it's impossible. It doesn't hold any water whatsoever. My relationship with God didn't change with a bang, but rather it's one of a slowly deepening friendship. I'm beginning to trust him more than ever before and it's not something that I can readily explain but I just know it in my heart. What would you say to someone who has questions about the New Testament? I would say don't fight them. Don't try and push them away because they won't go because I believe that Hashem puts them there. I would say study and more study. Check out the it is written in the New Testament and check out the Tanakh references that they quote and please read them in context. Read a chapter before and a chapter afterwards. Continue into the quoted verse until, you, until the theme obviously changes. Then you will see the true meaning of the verse because you would have read it in context. And you'll be surprised how many answers that you get. Also, if you've got a Bible with side margins that sometimes put the references down the side, check those out as well. And again, read them in context. Read a chapter before and a chapter after. Because just looking at the verse on its own is not going to help you. Again, you need to be reading them in context because it's all about context. Were there people who helped you on your journey at any point? Indeed, and this is in order. I have to thank my good friend Brian Parsons, who was so mightily used when he brought that massive question to me in printed form, Had the Messiah Come? Thank you, Brian. I want to thank Clayton Glennie, a friend who was a great help when I came to the Torah in May of 2014. Even though I trashed you when, in 2014, you arrived at the same place where I am now. And I'm just so grateful to Hashem that I was able to put things right with you, Clayton, before I flew to California in April of this year. You were the one that I contacted when I needed to talk to somebody about this massive faith crisis. You put me in touch with Rabbi Michael Skoback. And I thank him so much for his teachings, which I watch often, and for his labours on the pages that we share together on Facebook. Pages such as Leaving Christianity and Coming to the Truth of Torah. I want to thank Robert's Rabbi Stuart Federo, uh, April Nefores, and Ira Michelson, who were there when I began to wobble right at the very, very start of this walk at the end of April. Especially because there were giants in the land. The giants were like Isaiah 53 and scriptures in Micah and Zechariah. But I just want to thank you. Thank you, guys. What is the best thing about being where I am now? And what is the most challenging? The best thing about being where I am now is that I have an ongoing relationship with Hashem. Blessed be His name. A relationship that is direct. I haven't got to go through anybody. It's a direct father-child relationship. It's a relationship my heart has longed for for years. Many times I felt like giving up. But as I said earlier, I was could never ever let go of the fact that he loves me. He never let me go. He was always there spurring me on all the time that I knew there was no going back. And Baruch Hashem, there is certainly no going back now. Why? Because there's nothing to go back to. That's for the most challenging. It's the voluminous amount that there is to learn. Just that. But Hashem, blessed be his name, is he who has brought me this way. And he will teach me what he wants me to know when he wants me to know it. All I have to do is apply myself to study. He's not, me brought, he's not brought me this far to fail. I do want to stress to everyone who will watch this, 
but I'm not stressed about it at all, it's exciting. If I could go back and change one thing, what would it be? I don't think I'd change anything at all concerning the events that commenced in April 2015. May Hashem bless you, may He guard you and keep you, may He cause His face to shine upon you, be gracious to you and give you His utmost shalom. And of course, bring you to the truth.